Oops. Uh, well, anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. It's really a pleasure. Uh, it's a really great symposium. Um, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the cardiovascular effects in HIV with a little bit on COVID, mainly because we haven't had enough time <laughs> since COVID to understand long-term complications of COVID. But I hope I can show you some data from which we will learn a way to approach um, COVID and assessing mechanisms, et cetera. These are my um, disclosures. So uh, it's no surprise, and everyone here knows this, I hope and think, that um, even though the overall mortality from HIV is, is getting, is improving, of course, with all the ART, um, and it's become a chronic, stable disease, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease is, is increasing and is above that what you would anticipate from the general population and carefully matched studies. And this is shown here. This is a, a chart of various different epidemiological studies over the years. And the blue line is the line of unity. You can see the relative risk or hazard ratio of cardiovascular disease. Some of the studies are myocardial infarction. Others are more general. But you get the gist of it, which is th these studies very consistently show an increased rate of cardiovascular disease, about 50 to 100 percent increased in HIV patients compared to controls. The latest one is a global meta-analysis from SHA, which is about twofold. There was a very good one from the VAX cohort with a hazard ratio of about 1.5, which was adjusting for Framingham risk. It's a really important point because this is suggesting that it's not just traditional risk factors that are driving this. They're not unimportant, as I'll talk to you about, but they're not the sole issue here. We did a study um, a number of years ago now, which I think um, was illustrative. And we looked at the partners, uh, MGB cohort, and looked at patients with HIV from MGH and Brigham, and then non-HIV. The non-HIV group is 5 million people. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so it's a big control group with, but in any event, you can see that the relative risk of cardiovascular disease is 1.75. Okay. We also saw that there was more hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia in the HIV folks compared to the non-HIV folks. But in regression modeling, the, the troika, that troika accounted only for 25% of the excess risk, which is really consistent with some of the other studies that have followed. Again, so when you think about mechanisms and strategies to improve cardiovascular disease, you have to think of something that's going to attack both traditional and non-traditional risks. Um, so is, you know, what's driving cardiovascular disease in HIV? And one of the earliest clues came from the SMART study in which they um, randomized patients to a drug conservation or viral suppression group. So, of course, opportunistic disease was decreased in the viral suppression group. But contrary to their own hypothesis, viral, the, the uh, uh, cardiovascular disease was actually improved in the viral suppression group. They actually hypothesized that the ART might contribute to increased cardiovascular disease. But this is a really important study showing not only is it good for opportunistic infection, it's good for cardiovascular disease to get um, your virus under control. And um, when they looked specifically at cardiovascular disease, they saw an improvement. And when they suppressed, uh, when they used a tight suppression, they saw reductions in IL-6 and improvements in HDL. So there's a cytokine improvement um, and a lipid improvement, frankly, uh, in these patients, which was interesting. Uh, recent, or more recently, there's been connections, interesting connections between your immune set point and the cardiovascular disease prevalence. So on the left, Nader CD4 itself relates very significantly to myocardial infarction, as does your duration of immune suppression. So uh, if that's the case, we'll just give people ART and we'll be done with it, right? Not so fast. Um, and that's because when you do give patients ART, you mostly, but not entirely, normalize things. And this is a study we did, we published in JAMA a couple of years ago. We took uh, naive uh, patients uh, who were just getting their, their infection, and they, they were randomized to an earlier or later start. But we looked at um, effects on various key markers, for example, uh, activated uh, CD4 cells, CD8 cells, and um, monocytes. And you can see that um, after treatment, there was uh, a significant improvement, but not compared to a matched healthy control group. It wasn't fully, um, it wasn't fully uh, suppressed. 
And then we did something which I thought was quite interesting, which we took FDG PET, which is a technique we like to use, um, which measures um, uh, inflammation at the arterial surface, if you will. Um, and um, look at these two. There's two axillary lymph nodes in this patient with, um, you know, HIV presenting. And after ART, they went away entirely. And if you look at the aortic inflammation, though, by FDG PET, not only did it not go down, it, it sort of went up a little bit. So even though we were able to control most of the cytokines, control these juicy lymph nodes, there was significant persistent inflammation uh, in the aorta using FDG PET in this particular study. And that's consistent with chronic, studies of chronic cross-sectional studies, and this was also published in JAMA um, a few years earlier, but here we looked at HIV-infected patients Framingham risk match controls and patients with known cardiovascular disease. And FDG PET is a cogener that gets trapped in glycolysis, so it's a measure of overall metabolism. It's not macrophage specific, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it is a measure of overall metabolism or metabolic activity. And there was a striking increase in chronically infected HIV patients compared to uh, controls. I, and I think this is among the first bits of objective evidence of increased arterial inflammation in very well treated HIV infected patients. In fact, there was as much disease or more than in control patients who had known cardiovascular disease. Now, as I mentioned, FDG PET is um, sort of a gross measure of overall metabolism. And more recently, and I'll talk about this later in one of those talks that's following, um, we developed a novel macrophage-specific strategy. And I had this idea because I heard about this agent um, Tilmanicep, which is actually used to image the sentinel node in breast cancer. So um, it's used to image that. And I said, well, well, macrophages are so Im important in overall cardiovascular disease. Maybe we could use this as an imaging agent. And it has a mannose uh, moiety that attaches specifically to CD206. And uh, the, the level of uh, arterial inflammation using this agent was very significantly elevated compared to control. And I'll talk more about this. But you can see uh, some images of HIV infected and non. This is the arch of the aorta uh, on top. Now that's important, and this is a, a, sh a figure of um, uh, arterial surface of a stable plaque on top, which is and a non-stable high-risk plaque on the bottom. And our cardiology friends, I'm not sure if he's here today, but uh, he'll notice that the non-stable plaque is a thin cap fibroatheroma. And if you use um, uh, histological markings of these particular markers, you see that they're at the, at the uh, endothelial surface, there's a significant increase in CD206, CD163, CD68 monocyte markers. And that's interesting because that's what the imaging agent shows, that there's an increase uh, in, in the uptake for CD206, which is very commonly known to be at the endothelial surface in unstable high-risk plaques. And indeed, HIV-infected patients have high-risk plaque. They have high-risk morphology. And that's defined basically two ways. Actually, the plaque in unstable plaque is typically fattier, not as calcified, and it's eccentric to the lumen. And there's some CTs showing um, kind of an almost invisible image on the upper left. I don't know if this pointer works, but oh, uh, nah way over here. I can't control it. Sorry, I'm not drunk. Uh, there it is, over there. <laughs> so um, anyway, there's two basic, there's two basic um, uh, characteristics. And when we looked at comparing HIV-infected versus non-HIV-infected, you can see that uh, stably treated HIV-infected patients had significantly increased prevalence of high-risk morphology plaque. And that's important uh, for s development of subsequent therapeutics. And I don't have time to get into this, but there's significant differences based on sex in the presentation of myocardial infarction. Women have a higher relative risk of myocardial infarction, HIV women to non-HIV women, than, not, than HIV men to non-HIV men. Now, men have a higher absolute risk than women, that's true, but relative, you know, HIV to non, the risk is much higher in women. Uh, and that's quite interesting. 
And it's been shown that females with HIV who experienced an MI were more likely to present with type 2 MI versus uh, type 1. And type 2 MI is caused by myocardial oxygen supply demand mismatch, whereas type 1 is caused by thrombosis in the arterial artery supply in the embarked myocardium. And there are other factors, many more than I can go into today. But s recently, as I mentioned yesterday, there's been a, really, a, a focus on some genetic predictors uh, and factors. And one of them is so-called clonal expansion of hematopoietic cells with somatic mutations in the leukemic uh, genes. And this is associated with age and correlates with increased mortality. These are precancerous lesions that associate with monocyte activation and inflammation. And <laughs> we did a study collaborating with the Swiss HIV cohort, and it's just a striking takeoff in the prevalence of CHIP at an earlier age in HIV-infected patients than controls. And we're now genotyping the entire reprieve cohort, which I'll tell you in a minute. So as I said, there's multiple factors here. There's traditional risk, there's non-traditional risk, and any, any specific strategy will need to attack both of those uh, limbs of the tree. This brings me to Reprieve, which I don't have much time to go into, but I thought it would be interesting to tell this group. So Reprieve is the largest effort on the ha behalf of NIH to attack cardiovascular disease and HIV. This is a randomized trial to prevent vascular events, which I um, lead. We have 110 sites across the world, um, and uh, our recruitment closed in 2019. You can see all our sites in Africa and Haiti and Thailand and every Canada and Argentina and Peru, Peru everywhere. And so it's a really a global study, very diverse study. Um, and we screened over 10,000 patients to get 7,700 patients. And basically, we're randomizing patients to statin or, or placebo. And then we have a mechanistic substudy. And the endpoint is MACE, um, major adverse cardiovascular events. So you might say, why are you using a statin? And I think it's because of what I said before. You would need to attack both the traditional and non-traditional risk. And with one drug, if you can do, you know, kill two birds with one stone, that's, and it's cheap, and it's widely available. So that's important. So statins lower LDL just as well in HIV as non-HIV. And many, many studies have shown that they dampen immune activation. Here on the left is showing that they reduce activated CD4 uh, T cells um, and uh, tissue, uh, tissue factor producing activated monocytes uh, and, and, other, and other cells. So, uh, and, oh, so, sorry, insoluble CD14, which is a marker of immune activation. So they have a track record here, which we're trying to harness. We've also shown that they lower non-calcified plaque in HIV-infected patients, and they lower LPPLA2, which is a marker of arterial inflammation, as well as LDL. So they're promising, and we'll see. Now, the baseline data of Reprieve were recently published in JAMA, and here we showed that 48 percent of a group of patients with age 51 with a median ASCBD risk of four, four and a half. This is like a very, very low risk. 48%, half of them had plaque, this is crazy. And in fact, even, you can't see it, but even the, in the group with a risk of less than 2.5%, about 20% um, or so had plaque, and 23% had vulnerable plaque features in this particular cohort. We've looked and compared Reprieve to other cohorts. SCAPUS is a European cohort that's primary prevention, and Reprieve has much more overall plaque and non-calcified plaque than scapus, and actually has as much as PROMISE, which is a cohort of known cardiovascular disease. We've done proteomics looking, and I don't have time to go into this, for markers of vulnerable plaque, and some really interesting markers came out of this. But if you do um, knowledge-based interactions, there's really a huge focus on the TNF R2 and non-canonical NF kappa beta pathways suggesting, and I can talk more about this if you have a question if you want, the um, inflammasome pathways. And we all know that there was actually a very interesting study in non-HIV infected patients with canakinumab, which is an IL-1 beta antagonist, which improved and reduced MACE. The problem is it also increased serious infection. So I'm not sure this is the drug, but I'm just pointing out that there are strategies which may improve the inflammasome, which may be useful. 
Now let me turn to COVID, and I don't have much to say about COVID, just a few points. First of all, there are a number of potential mechanisms. Most of them were reviewed yesterday, thrombosis, cytokine storm, other ones, okay? But I want to show some interesting data from some papers I was reading to prepare for this talk. So in my world, we're, all, we're worried about diabetes too, by the way, it's not just cardiovascular disease. Um, and this is a, a 428,000 British COVID patients matched uh, equally to non-COVID without known diabetes or cardiovascular disease. They were matched on age and sex, and their mean age is 60. And you can see the vertical line is the date of the incidence of um, the COVID. And you can see that um, patients with diabetes are more prone to get COVID, and there's an exacerbation, and it sort of stays persistent. In terms of cardiovascular disease, there is a major spike in cardiovascular disease right around the time of infection, okay? But then it kind of goes away. Now, I do realize there were only 52 weeks out in this study, okay? So I'm not talking about 10 years out, obviously. But so it, there's a spike and it comes back down. It's kind of interesting. Um, it's probably too hard to read, but pulmonary embolism is the number one cause of cardiovascular disease. And atherosclerosis is the third highest peak. Um, another study, though, and this is the last study before I conclude, looked at 73,000 uh, VH uh, veterans patients who survived COVID. It stratified them by simple positivity, hospitalization, or hospitalization and ICU, followed for six months post-COVID compared to background. And here they showed that patients who were hospitalized, or those particularly in the ICU, six months out do have a significant increase in acute cor in coronary disease as well as arrhythmias and other things, chest pain, et cetera. So I think this is an area ripe for further investigation and I'm guessing that many of the same themes that have occurred in HIV will also be occurring here. So I'm going to conclude uh, by saying that I hope I've shown you that both traditional and non-traditional risk factors contribute to increased cardiovascular disease in HIV manifesting as inflamed non-calcified high-risk plaque, very unusual for someone that young with such a low risk score, okay, in association with immune activation. Modulation of traditional non-traditional risk is necessary to prevent CBD. ART with viral suppression is likely not enough. Um, Reprieval and formless of the utility and safety of a statin strategy to prevent MACE and reduce plaque in people with HIV, reducing LDL, improving inflammatory indices. Other strategies may be useful. And in COVID, CBD is increased, but it occurs mostly in the acute setting. It may relate to inflammation, cytokine excess, and thrombosis. And there will be a need to monitor post-COVID long-term for cardiovascular disease, undoubtedly. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful talk. I was you. Uh, very uh, you Thank know, you. impressed. And I have a lot of questions, but um, I would focus on one uh, specifically for the chip. Um, what it's, it's really you know, impressive to see that you know, huge bump yeah. um, in HIV you know, patient. I guess those patient uh, viral titer has to be controlled, even though they have this yes. you know, increase of. So, what's the link between these, you know, controlled HIV virus versus, you know, um, chip yeah. in the bone marrow? Yeah. yeah. I, well, I'll tell you some data that we literally just got back two days ago. We, I, as I said, we genotype reprieve. Okay, and I think we're going to show that there's a strong relationship to Nader CD4, low Nader CD4. So that's um, that's crazy, you know. So. Um, not crazy, but it's, it's important and interesting that your um, immune set point, you know, years prior to your current status is working to potentially drive some of those mutations. So I think it may relate more to that than your current viral load status. Um, but I, I, we literally are just going through the data and I'm going to have to present that more formally at some point. You can, you can ask another one, I think. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. but. Um you know, given that the chip, the impact of chip is mainly on myelin, you know, yes. lineage. Yes. But you were pointing out the CD4, know, which I is know. completely different. I know. And then a lot but of stuff has been done on the myeloids, including the, you know, Ken Walsh stuff. Yeah. 
but nothing has been done on T-cell part. So yeah, I know. I, I mean, we're just just starting to dig in on this, and uh, you know, stay tuned. But um, it is kind of interesting. And then what's really interesting about this is we'll genotype reprieve, and we'll see whether the un no one has looked whether long term it's a relationship to mace. I mean, it's all well and good to say there's high chip mutations, but if to see that if they're linked to mace, that's very interesting. Also, if there's um, a precision medicine analysis to this, whether there's an interaction with statins. There is an interaction with kenyakinumab. People who get kenyakinumab who have chip mutations have a better response than people who don't. So it would be very interesting to see and reprieve if that's the case um, and to use this knowledge to develop further, further therapies. Also, uh, the anti-IL-1 therapy reduced Lung cancer, right? Yes, so. yes. Well, yeah, yes, it did. It did. Um, the, the the company that makes that is not keen to be using it um, <laughs> commercially. So it's been, but I, I'm not sure I would pull out pull it out for HIV anyway. But yes, it it that's absolutely a critical point that you just made. Very very important. Other questions? Yeah, I think right behind you. Yeah, the myeloid PET imaging um, approach. D does does your tracer cross the blood-brain barrier? Uh, and if so, do you see any uptake in the CNS when you do the uh, carotid artery PET, scans? Your PET would, but I, we haven't trained our camera on that. Um, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting idea. Um, but we haven't looked. That's a it's a really that's a really good idea. We see a lot of activity in the liver, um, especially when uh, the with the monocyte activation one that we uh, which I'll give you more information about later so maybe I can address that a little bit later and I'll show you some pictures has the monocyte imaging been used like to predict who might develop sepsis or other like cytokine storm like no that's a, yeah that's a good question um, it's primarily been used in the arthritis field so basically they can um, predict which joint lesions are going to progress, and they can predict which ones are going to be amenable to therapy with, you know, anti-inflammatories. Um, I have not seen uh, that, but we'll we'll be able to uh, to look at that in some of our studies. It's really that's a really good question. Thank you, Steve. This has been yes. a uh, therapeutic uh, desert in terms of modulating. Mm -hmm immune activation and having an impact on, yeah. on these sorts of outcomes. There's a series of publications now on colchicine which might yeah. you know, intervene on this pathway. Would you like to speculate around that? It's very interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure what I, how I would predict the way that's going to go. Um, uh, I, think, I think for HIV infected patients, trying a statin strategy is reasonable first because there is some contribution of dyslipidemia in those patients which colchicine would not get and it has side effects. So I, I you know, the st statins are incredibly safe um, and they're easy to take. I'm not saying, you know, one size fits all, but if, if you had to pick the widest possible applicable tool, if that, if that works, it's a good start. Colchicine may, may have its issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you.